So thank you ever so much, everyone, for joining us on our day two of the data management planning and overcoming challenges in social science data sharing shock workshop. Um, I hope you have enjoyed uh, yesterday. If you have not been yesterday, please don't worry. All the materials are available online. And I'm going to put now in the chat where all the materials are available um, on the Google Drive. Um, everyone should have access. Any problems, please um, let me know. So. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as mentioned, the presentations are recorded for your own news and your colleagues. Um, all participants will receive a link to the recordings. You have the slides already on the Google Drive. As for yesterday, any questions, please write them in the chat, ask them during the Q&A session, or use our questions Padlet. The Padlet is fully anonymous, so you can ask any questions you might want. Um, and we have the post-event feedback form as well um, available um, to be used. Now, uh, today, we have three speakers. I am still Christina from yesterday, um, the Collections Development Manager at the UK Data Archive. Um, thank you all once again ever so much for joining us. The main aim um, today here is um, with my um, colleagues to show how we can overcome challenges in data sharing, especially by implementing a very good data management plan. And we have alongside us Anka, um, and Maureen. Maureen will do a short talk today about secondary data use, how to find data um, and how to use it in your research. And all of us will be leading an exercise. Uh, what's the best way to learn them doing a little bit of practice. Um, we'll open some breakout rooms. They're not Sucked. compulsory. If you would like to join the breakout rooms, please do join the breakout rooms. But if you would like to do the exercise individually, you can do that as well. Now, moving forward, um, this is a short recap from yesterday for the uh, attendees that were unable to attend. We are based at the UK Data Archive, the lead partner of the UK Data Service. We have made all the um, links, um, as many links as possible in our presentation, so you can have a read about us, um, check our data management guidelines, check all the data that we have. We currently have over 8,500 studies in our collection. But today we would not be here without our SHOCK partners. Um, SHOCK stands for Social Science and Humanities Open Cloud. And the main aim of SHOCK was to create a social science and humanities open platform and provide uh, a network for people involved in the social sciences world um, to discuss and share materials. Now, if we move forward, what does SHOCK offer? Why is shock of, uh, of youth? We do have on and offline training. Of course, with the pandemic, most of the training moved to online and all the materials are made available online. And it does provide interdisciplinary training network, especially when we provide training. It's fantastic to be in touch with others that provide training and try to pick their brains um, around how best to do um, training. We do have the shock open marketplace where we have tools and data that you can use. Um, in case you have not visited SHOCK, um, please do um, have a look at all the training materials that are available. Again, all the slides are um, full of links, so please visit the links. And also the SHOCK open marketplace for different tools um, and services that you might use. So yesterday we have had a look at a structure of DMPs. We had a couple of templates. We've talked about a core um, core sections of DMPs. We've looked at key principles and standards to use in DMPs, also the ethical and legal considerations we need to bear in mind throughout the research data life cycle and how to actually specify in a data management plan how to um, how you are overcoming any ethical and legal issues. We've talked about anonymization, pseudo-anonymization, documenting data, how do we perform quality assurance, how do we ensure that our data is secure and safe? And that covered, again, the whole research data life cycle from collecting the data to using the data to sharing the data. And we've also had a look at responsibilities and costing. 
now uh, thank you all ever so much for completing the um, last minute menti yesterday about what have you most enjoyed um, from the day. Um, and you can see a lot of uh, participants really like the exercises, the practical advice, um, the different questions, um, the fact that we have a Q&A session. Um, we've reserved the Q&A session and we've got amazing feedback from a previous event. Um, it's fantastic to have time to chat, especially when we're talking about challenges in data sharing. They can be quite um, Topics of discussion, I would say, um, some of them could be potentially quite difficult to overcome in looking from the different angles. Now, what do we have prepared for day two? We, of course, have the welcome, um, and my colleague Maureen is going to present um, data collection assessment. So we're going to be looking, how do you have a look at what is the data available? Can I use it in my research project? Um, and then we follow up with an exercise we do hope you're going to find very interesting. Um, it comprises of three different research scenarios and um, you will be asked to um, identify any sharing problems that you might think of, um, including ethical and legal, legal problems in sharing that data and also hopefully try to um, formulate a couple of DMP sections based on the examples that we're giving. The exercise can be done in a breakout room. We're going to be opening breakout rooms, but we're very flexible here. We want everyone to be comfortable. If you want to join a breakout room, you're more than welcome. If you want to do the exercise individually, that is totally fine because we do follow with a group discussion around the problematic aspects we found in the scenarios. and. Um, um, the ideas on how to overcome them. We're going to have a short 15 minutes break at um, quarter past 11, followed by a presentation around common challenges in data sharing and the lessons that we've learned. How do we overcome this? It contains a couple of further reading resources as well, um, which if you are interested on how others are actually approaching this subject, please do read them. We'll also have the Q&A session Again, please do enter your questions on the Padlet available, put them in the chat or ask them during the Q&A session. And we'll um, finish with the close of the workshop. Um, and now I'm going to pass over to my colleague Maureen for her presentation. I will stop my share. Hello. All right. And I will stop my share, I think. There we go. Let me just, all right. Does that look like a full screen PowerPoint to you, Christina? Yes. Excellent, okay, it's a good start. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about data collections and assessment of existing data. So basically what do archive data sets look like? What are some of the criteria that you might use when you're assessing existing data? And how do you find those data sets? So um, when you're filling out your data management plan, there is usually a, a section um, which has an assessment of existing data sources or a similar sort of name. And they're usually referring to these sorts of questions. Is there evidence that there is already existing data and has that been considered and evaluated? Is there evidence presented that the project um, is, is not creating data when there are existing resources that can be reused? Um, and if existing data is being used in your project, have you addressed issues around copyright um, and that sort of thing to make sure it's possible to reuse that data? So this is, the, this is the sort of basis that I'm coming from here. But before I go on, I just wanted to ask a few questions of you guys. And hopefully I can. So there's three questions there. Have you searched for data before? Have you reused data before? and what kind of data have you reused if you, if you have reused data before? So I'll give you just a minute um, to have a look at those questions and, and answer. It's quite nice. I get the real time kind of look at how people are answering. Gonna give just another few seconds for any stragglers to put in their answers. Okay. So a bit of a mix here. 
Um, all right, so I end the poll and share the results with you. So most of you have searched for data before, but there are some of you who have yet to discover the delights of data archives. Um, but out of those, you know, uh, thinking of those, then only, a well, just over half of you have reused data before. So more of you searching for it than reusing it, um, which is interesting. And then in terms of the kind of data you've reused, unsurprising quantitative comes away as the winner um, of the types of data there. Um, which, you know, is, is usually the, the tradition within quantitative research is to reuse data. It's less of a thing within qualitative, but it is becoming a little bit more common. So let me just, and hopefully now you're back to my PowerPoint. Yes. So when you're looking at a, a data archive, some of you who have reused, uh, who have looked for data before, um, or for those of you who have not looked for or reused data, you might be thinking data collections out there, what does that actually look like? Um, when you are looking at an archive data set, you usually end up downloading some kind of zipped file and it'll look like this. So you'll, you'll have some documentation associated with the, with the um, data set and then you will have some data files. This RTF files shows that this is a qualitative collection and if I were to open up that RTF folder, you then simply get, um, you know, a mass of files, and these are all of your your uh, data. So this is a this particular collection is um, a set of essays from school leavers. So each of those is a is a different participant with a different essay, and it's it's a fairly similar thing for quantitative. So with some of our older quantitative quantitative collections, you might end up with something like a PDF, handwritten things, but usually, you know, or you might have something that's a bit, it, that's transcribed, but usually you'd get something that's like an SPSS document or a Stata document. Um, Excel sheets, I've also seen Excel sheets, but it's a similar kind of idea where you would end up with some sort of documentation folder and then another folder that literally you just open and all of your data is right there. There are some um, places that you can use a sort of interface. So this is the OECD interface. Um, I know the GSS, the General Social Survey in the US has a similar sort of thing. So um, where those are longitudinal studies or where those are, you know, kind of panel periodic, um, where they where they resample, um, you usually find that they end up kind of creating their own interface that you can use. And you can analyze the data within that interface or you can also see that there's a, there's a download button here and you can download that. It's usually to an Excel sheet or SPSS sheet um, that you're able to then analyze yourself and, and manipulate the data as needed. There are some more um, creative types of data that are available as well. So depending on what kind of research you're interested in doing, there's probably somewhere out there, there's, there's gonna be some data that might link with that. So for example, we have, um, uh, quite a bit of data coming in now where they are using images or video and audio. Um, sometimes you have to go to an archive that's specific for video and audio because the files are so big, they get a, a little bit um, uh, difficult to, to store all of that. Um, but you can find uh, data sets out there that, that do have those sort of in, uh, visual kind of data. Um, we also get, not very often, but we also get things like researcher notes. So on the right side, this is from an ethnography, um, and they, they've actually deposited alongside the data, alongside the interviews and in that, they've also deposited their researcher notes, their day-to-day. -day. Um, there's also some interesting examples in some of our legacy projects, like the upper left corner here, where they've done an interview and then at the end of it, they've asked the um, interviewers to write a bit of a reflection and those were deposited alongside the, the interviews themselves. So you can find some quite interesting uh, practices and tidbits when you start looking through some of the archived data sets that are available. And what I've kind of learned from working at an archive, so I'm, I'm, um, my focus is on qualitative data sets, um, but some of the things that I've learned is that, of course, every data set has its own historical, 
political and social context. So some of the um, seminal research that we've kind of upheld as, you know, this is, this is a gold standard or this has kind of shaped the way we look at social class today. When you actually go in and look at the data set, you find all of the interesting nuances that kind of make research a bit messy. Um, so you, you can start to see, for example, where there's been some, some interviewer notes that have been deposited alongside it. And you can see some of the biases and think, well, actually, this would be a really good research project to redo. So looking through some of the, the past uh, data sets gives you inspiration on what sorts of things need to be looked at again or need to be looked at in a, in a different light. I've also found that no data set is perfect. Um, so as, as somebody who specializes in, in um, qualitative data sets, I sometimes find a little bit of resistance among qualitative researchers to reuse. Um, so it, it's more of a thing in quant, but you know, qualitative data sets are really useful as well. Um, and I think sometimes we get lured into the idea of, well, you know, you, you really need to be in an interview to understand and appreciate that data. Um, and actually, when you start going through the various data sets, you realize that there's no perfect way of doing research. And research is really messy sometimes. Um, and looking at it from, from another perspective gives you a little bit more insight into how knowledge is created. And finally, I've also learned that every data set has value. Um, and it's especially valuable when it's accompanied by documentation. So I wouldn't say I've ever looked at a data set and thought, oh, that can't be reused. It might be reused in, in quite creative ways, but you know, every data set that we have has some kind of value. So when you're looking at the assessment of existing sources, the sorts of things that peer reviewers are probably going to be looking for is some kind of sufficient explanation of where the data is coming from and how the data is going to be collected or reused. And if you are collecting new data, you should have some kind of sufficient rationale for why collection of new data is needed. And there's a couple ethical reasons why this might be. So one of those is simply that recontacting the same participants over and over again for purposes of research, and especially if they're vulnerable populations, I mean, there's, there's a real ethical question about doing that. Um, so for example, one, one of the um, main um, research funders in the UK put out an urgency grant on a specific topic and a number of, of, of uh, people, uh, researchers put forward proposals um, that would fit with the, with the call uh, within this urgency grant. And what ended up happening was that there was uh, 13 different projects awarded and all of them went to the same contacts, the same charities to uh, source their participants. Um, and so it was the same, same participants that, that ended up contributing to three or four different research projects. Um, and while the participants said, yes, I'm happy to do that, I'm willing to take part in the research, at the same time, there's questions about, well, should we be going back and, and resampling from the same population every time? Um, there's also ethical considerations that are a little more economic, which is simply that if we're going to use public money, so if it, especially if it's research uh, that's been funded publicly, you know, we need to maximize the value of that. So we know that the, the, we do have those kind of national surveys um, that are regularly collected. A lot of money gets put into ensuring that they're good questions, that they've got a representative sample, that it limits bias, you know, so those should be reused where possible. So we have the kind of humanitarian poll as well as the economic poll to actually, we should be looking at what data is already there. And there's, you know, five key points that I would say when you're looking at what some of the existing sources are, what you should be considering. Um, and these are data type, what kind of data is out there, what the data source was, um, so where did it come from, the volume, so this refers to both sort of, yes, perhaps how much data is there, but also the range, are there any holes in the data, the accessibility of that data, and the, the data file uh, formats. There may also be another discussion that comes out um, as you sort of go through these quite practical 
uh, key points when you're looking at existing data sources. And that might be, you know, the sort of relevance for your, your particular research project. And I have to say, when I originally wrote this slide, I actually put down trustability. Um, but I'm kind of, because uh, I've worked so long in an archive where I see every, every data set has a value, every data has a data set has a particular social and historical context in which it, it can apply. Um, I'm sort of of the opinion that it's not that we don't trust any kind of data sets or any kind of research that's already been done, but rather is it specific to what you are looking at? So is it, is it relevant enough for your own research project? So when we're talking about types of, of data collections, um, this, this list is based off of what we use in the, at the UK Data Service to kind of um, uh, categorize the data we have. So there's survey microdata, this might be cross-sectional uh, cross or longitudinal or panel data. Um, we do have some international micro, macro data, which is available as aggregated uh, statistics. And then of course there's census data, which is both aggregated and available, uh, some of it is available as microdata. On top of that, we also um, have some administrative data. So we're talking about like health and education um, data. There is also some business micro data, and then we put all of the, the sort of qualitative and mixed methods data together, um, which is quite diverse, uh, quite a diverse group in and of itself. Um, when you're thinking about writing up about your assessment, you may follow these types of data. You may just be looking at quite a broad level of is it quantitative or qualitative, and this is what I'm interested in. So the type of data collection, we're, we're thinking in quite broad terms here. When you then move on to look at the source of the data, now a lot of our quantitative data comes from official agencies. So this might be you know, central government, but there might also be some international statistical time series you're interested in. Um, there's a number of research institutions, certainly within the UK, that have, that have kind of centralized funding um, that, that produce uh, uh, regular editions of, of their um, data sets. Um, we also, at the UK Data Service, get quite a lot of data from individual academics. So they might have been funded through a research grant, or it might be just, you know, this is part of what they do. They just go out and, and, and do more research. Um, and then deposit that data with us. They do have a research grant, um, as I think was, was mentioned yesterday, often it, it comes with the caveat that, um, you know, if it's funded by public money, it, it should be deposited um, for purposes of reuse. So usually with ones that we come from, that we get from individual academics, those have been funded through a grant. But we also have some more, um, diverse sources, including market research agencies, and of course there's public records, historical sources. Um, there may be archives that specialize in specific types of historical sources. So for example, the National Archives in the UK gets all of the policy documents um, related to uh, government workings that are released regularly after so many years. As you're thinking about the data sources, it's, it's not just simply, ah, yes, this, this qualitative data that's been you know, collected by individual academics is available. You might find that actually you have a broader discussion there about some of the contextual dimensions. So those, that historical or political or social context that I referred to earlier, it might be about how complete the data is. So there might be a lot of data, but it only looks at, you know, Middle class households, and you're actually interested in, in you know, uh, lower incomes. Um, so it's actually thinking about the range as well um, of what's out there. Is there holes in terms of oh, either your participants or the topic, the specific topic areas you're interested in? You might also be interested in the provenance of the data set. So, any of you who've kind of dabbled in a, a bit of historiography, you know, part of um, the wonder of, of looking through existing data sources is not just finding a really interesting data source in and of itself, but then what's that then connected to as well and what stories come from those connections. So you might be interested in how that data set actually sits, sits amongst um, other data sources as well. 
Um, so you might be interested in, in um, speaking a bit about the provenance of that data. You might also be um, need to address the verifiability of it. So if it uh, is a data set that's deposited, that's been manipulated in some way, do you have access to that original data set? Um, you know, how, how, and this is where trustworthy might come into a bit of play here if you want to use that word, but you know, are you sure of how the data has been treated basically um, and whether or not you're, you're able to access the raw data if you need to. So when we're thinking about volume accessibility um, and formatting, so the, the amount of data that's out there, the volume of it, I mean, that's going to impact the timing and processing that you have. So if, you, if you're putting forward a data management plan where you are reusing existing data, but you find that actually there's, you know, 453 oral histories as part of this Edwardian's collection of, of oral histories, and they're really useful, but do you have time to look through all of that data, or do you need to think about what parts of those data set are, are you going to use? So certainly if you're reusing existing sources, think about the amount of time that would be needed to process. Um, there's also an interesting case of um, April Galway, who is a PhD student, who stumbled upon the Millennium Memory Bank, which is, which is these sort of radio clips um, of uh, uh, people who sort of grew up post-World War II and some of their experiences. And she was sort of limiting it, limiting it to, I'm really interested in single mothers in this time period, which was great. But then she found that there was very little metadata associated with that. So she had to go through the entire Millennium Memory Bank to find the interviews that were relevant for her. So that processing time all of a sudden, even though she had a very you know, um, workable volume of data, the processing time that, that went with that um, became, became quite time intensive. You might also um, need to think not in terms of processing as in analyzing, but actually do you need to do something to the data before you can analyze it? Does it need any cleanup? So in terms of volume, think about that processing time that might be involved. In terms of accessibility, um, so I think a bit about licensing and openness was, was mentioned yesterday, but it's just quite simply, do you, do you have access to the data? Are you able to reuse it? Certainly if you're um, using data that is from an archive like the UK Data Archive, um, yeah, we've, we've, most of our, our data is licensed as such so that you, you can just sort of you know, register with us and you'd be able to have access to download it. Um, there are some collections that are more controlled um, and that does include things like embargoes where the data isn't available for a certain amount of time. So you just need to double check that you actually do have access to the data. And then finally, the kind of format that that data comes in, um, is it machine readable? Is it sitting in a box somewhere and you have to, you have to actually go in and um, uh, to the archive itself? So something like the mass observation archives, for example, which put out um, these directives that people would write essays to. A nice representative sample of the UK, really interesting topics that are done you know, regularly. They put out directives three or four times a year. They've been doing this for decades. So they have quite a lot of data there, but if it's older than, uh, I think it's something like 2005, it's older than that, they were all handwritten. So you, you have to, unless somebody has done a project to digitize it, you'd have to actually go to the archive to access that data. So is it something that's machine readable and do you have the software needed um, to, to use that data? So now you might be thinking, well, you know, I've, I've um, done some searching for data before, but, you know, um, I haven't reused any and, and, you know, I'm not quite sure how I would go about actually finding the data that I need. And um, it used to be the case, um, perhaps, you know, a, a decade or two decades ago, it used to be the case that while some data was made available, it was kind of a, you need to know how to access it. Um, but now there's loads of tools that can help you with that. So um, SESTA, for example, has their data catalog. 
um, and there's just about 40,000 uh, data sets that, that are um, available to search through their data catalog. Um, on top of that, you can, you can go to the data archives themselves. Um, so if you know that there's a specific area of interest, there might be an archive that has that specifically holds data on that. So for example, the Imperial War Museum or the British Library both hold documents associated with World War I, World War II. So if this is, if that's an area you're interested in, there might be a specific archive for that. Um, and like I say, public funded projects often have to deposit in an established archive as part of the grant they receive. So there is quite a lot of data out there and there's definitely the tools to kind of, of look for that. Those data catalogs are really useful starting points. Um, finding the data though, does rely on a couple of things. Requires that the data collection has good metadata associated with it. Um, so this is, you know, has somebody actually filled out a catalog page for it? And is it sufficiently comprehensive to address all of the aspects that you could use that data for? Is there documentation associated with that data? Um, does it have things like a, like a DOI um, associated with it? Um, or does that documentation, documentation kind of shift and move around? And then finally, you know, is it linked up with any of the search tools? Um, like I say, such a data catalog is a good starting point. Google has also launched a, a few years ago, they've launched a, a data search as well. So, you know, you've got like Google Scholar and the regular Google, you also have um, Google data that you can now search as well. Um, and the archives themselves will always have some kind of finding aid um, or hopefully a, an actual data catalog online. Although much, um, what's the word, uh, much less common than, than creating a, a catalog within uh, a catalog page within a um, search tool, you can also look for data papers. So the Research Data Journal for Humanities and Social Sciences, for example, publishes data papers. There's, there's a, a, a couple other um, data journals out there. And what a data paper is, it's basically when somebody deposits a data set, they can then write up about a 2000 word journal article, which describes that data in a little bit more detail. So how it's structured, how accessible it is, um, and what some of the methods were, well, what the methods were. Um, for the collection of that data. Um, and they're really useful kind of short pieces that expand beyond just the sort of method section, the sanitized method section of um, what you might publish in a research report. You know, it, it really focuses on what is the data, can, you know, how is it collected, can you reuse it? Um, so data papers are really useful too. So if you're interested in just browsing for what kind of data is out there because you're looking for that inspiration of what else can I research in this area, it might be useful to go to something like the Research Data Journal for Humanities and Social Sciences and having a look. They also write up case studies as, as part of that data uh, paper journal. So these case studies will give you a little bit more um, detail and, and, and visuals alongside that. Shock also has some use cases. UK Data Service also publishes case studies. Um, I think even Sage Research Methods, uh, Sage is one of the you know, main publishers in the UK has um, case studies that they write up as well about research that's been done and what kind of data is available and, and um, showcasing the methods that were used. So case studies might also be a really useful point um, if you're looking to kind of get a little bit more information about the data that's out there. Um, and I did say earlier, I'm a qualitative specialist. So there is a particular challenge that's associated with qualitative data. Um, and that is that when you collect qualitative data, often that data is so rich, it can be used in, in so many different ways. And it's difficult to capture that within just a catalog page, a quick summary of what that data is about can certainly summarize the research project and add some keywords, but that doesn't mean it's totally comprehensive of what you could reuse that, that data set for. So the UK Data Service has come up with a, a tool to sort of browse, search, and cite qualitative data. And it's called QualiBank. 
Um, right now, there's, a, there's about 50 collections that are within Quali Bank, um, and we're looking to hopefully add more as time goes on. But if you are interested in qualitative data specifically, um, you could use Quali Bank. And rather than just searching through the abstract page or the summaries, it actually searches through the data itself. So you do need to register and log in with us in order to view all of the collections that are available. But it works a bit like Google where you just put in your keyword um, and then it would bring up all of the collections and, and all of the specific data files that mention that keyword. And you get a better idea then of what's actually sitting within the, within the data sets um, and whether or not it's useful for your particular research projects. That might be a, you know, Quantitative data may, may have some similar challenges where you can do some quite creative things with quantitative data, but usually you get those variable listings and you, and you can get an, a sort of at a glance look quite easily. It's a little bit harder with qualitative data to get that kind of comprehensive summary in one go. Um, so being able to quickly search through the data cross data sets at the same time without having to individually look at each data set is really, really useful. So in summary, um, there is an ethical responsibility, and certainly it's something that's asked for on data management plans to assess the existing sources before um, collecting new data. You should look to assess those data sets by the data type, the source, the volume, the accessibility, and the formatting. And in doing so, you might find inspiration for your uh, new rationale for your research project or you might actually find that there is some existing data that you can either complement with new data, or you might even just be able to do a re reuse project. Um, and the data discovery will depend a bit on the associated documentation, the metadata that's available in the search tools that are you, you are using, um, but certainly using some of those established data catalogs like says does um, is a good starting point for that. And then just as a side note for you as, you, as you guys are doing your own research projects and thinking about hopefully depositing that data then, um, good data management throughout your project will improve the discovery of your data set and will also increase the value and the impact of your um, research. So it's really important that as you're going along and, and thinking about your data management that you are keeping track of what some of that associated documentation might be what metadata needs to be made available alongside your data set to make it more discoverable um, and ensuring that you're depositing somewhere where you can mint a DOI and you know that data set is going to have a, a sort of persistent long-term um, uh, signpost to it. Um, so good data management will certainly allow others to reuse your data and spread that impact even further um, of what you've done. So, that is it from me. Um, thank you, Christina. I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Maureen. Um, please do ask questions in the chat on the Padlet um, as you wish. Um, but we'll move on to the exercise. Um, and as promised, that session will not be recorded. We want to encourage you to, to speak freely. So I will um, pause the recording. Really. So the recording has now started and we're looking at common challenges in data sharing in different lessons that we have learned. So yesterday uh, we have asked you, what are your research interests? And we have seen such a variety of research interests from social science to sociology to ethnicity, cross-cultural, neuroscience, so a variety of different research interests in the audience. Now, we have a couple of questions. Have you collected data? And we can see most of the people in the audience have collected data with 88%. Um, and also, have you ever conducted secondary data analysis? So have you used existing data for research projects? And again, here the balance um, was closer with 56 yes and 44 no. So today we're going to have a very short menti. It's um, hopefully... Uh, nothing too onerous on your side. I am just bringing up the code and making sure I am putting it in the chat for everyone. Um, if you could please visit menti at menti.com. The voting code is A3407058. And I am now going to share my menti. So let's start presenting. Have you shared your data? 
oh, preparing the data now. We have someone that's preparing the data now. Um, we have um, people that have shared the data, haven't shared the data, no. No one is saying data sharing is precluded. That is a very good start. Just giving you a couple of more minutes for people to, to get to the Menti. The, the link is in the chat as well as the Menti code. I'm just checking it's in the chat. If it is in the chat, just double checking. So we have a majority of people that have not shared their data. So collected data or use secondary data, but have not shared the data. Now let's move to the second question. And what were your challenges of sharing the data? So even if you've shared the data, have you encountered other challenges? What were those? And for those that said, no, I haven't shared my data. Why haven't you shared your data? Trying to get a bit more personal here um, to better understand the challenges that you are facing. And in the presentation, we're going to be looking at other challenges that other researchers are facing in different ways of overcoming this. And then of course, we do have the Q&A session to discuss more um, around your personal experience with sharing the data. We do have the Padlet. If you want to um, add any questions, please do add them onto the Padlet. Um, we have legal doubts. Yes, when it comes to ethical and legal considerations, those are the difficult part, I would say, when it comes to sharing data. Um, and to bear in mind is you, there is always support in place. So here I'm talking about repositories, support staff. If you have legal doubts, get in touch with different archives that could actually um, host your data. Um, they would be able to provide information around whether the data can be shared, how it can be shared, et cetera. Resources to clean data. Yes, there are time constraints always when it comes to, um, to sharing. And we're going to see this is actually one of the challenges that is most encountered as well um, with uh, fellow researchers. Anonymizing qual data. Yes, we were having a discussion in the, in the breakout room um, around how, he, he, well, easier to anonymize qual data. However, when we're talking about qual data, it's quite of a different dimension and anonymizing qual data is usually very resource intensive. Consent, problems with consent. And again, I do hope the um, uh, model consent form will come as handy um, to you for future projects. And we're actually going to be looking at how um, successful retrospective consent could be as well. Uh, in case you do not have consent for data sharing and retrospective consent is still possible. Time preparing metadata. Yes, again, I can see a, a theme around the time. There are time constraints when it comes to data sharing. And that's why preparing the data management plan in time, using a checklist and a costing tool to actually see, okay, so I am making available, I want to make available survey data and qual data. How much time would I need to prepare the quant data? How much time would I need to prepare the quant data? It's always best to actually quantify all of this proper code book. Again, when it comes to specific things such as proper code book, if you um, have a repository, you can get in touch. Again, this could be an institutional repository, a national repository data archive. Do get in touch with them. Um, depending on the type of um, software that you're using, you can actually code book get the code books directly from the data. So that might be an easy solution there. We also have no incentive to share. Um, and that is a, um, let's say, difficult topic because, of course, we do come from the um, data service, data archive world. So when it comes to us, there are so many different incentives to share. Um, and in the Q&A session, if possible, to discuss more around that because we're curious to see from a researcher perspective, how come the incentives aren't necessarily seen as um, very attractive? Let's, um, let's say it that way, because of course, when we're thinking of benefit benefits from data sharing, we're thinking of different stakeholder groups. So we have the researcher that actually shares that I collected the data, I have consent to share everything, it's fine. I'm sharing my data. By sharing my data and actually um, adhering to different standards we have been talking, like having that persistent identifier, that leads to an increase in citation to new collaborations as well. You might get researchers across the world saying, oh, this is my topic of interest. 
this person already collected data, has done this research, I want to get in touch to a collaborative work. We are talking about the public as well here when we're talking about benefits of data sharing. So you have the public that knows a lot of data is being um, collected. A lot of funders actually invest money in this data collection. By sharing the data, we actually show how transparent and policy changing data could be. We also have, of course, the research participants, and this is something that we were discussing in the in the breakout room as well, especially when it comes to um, specific population, either people um, suffering from um, different illnesses, or let's say migrants, for example, sharing that data or actually trying to enable the sharing of that data via consent, for example, it's important because you are helping that participant tell their story, share their issues, and actually others allow, allowing others to use the data might lead to policy changing impact um, research. We also have a small patient population. Yes, um, this is extremely common. It's a common concern when it comes to experimental data as well. And to bear in mind, we can have access restrictions in place. Um, so this, again, would be something that ideally having a discussion with a repository, um, either institutional or national, around the data you've collected. Can this be shared? I have all the consent in place. However, I'm really worried about the risk of identity viability in the data, how can I mitigate against that risk? Multiple archives. Yes, there are multiple archives in, in the presentation today. I, um, just now, uh, we will be covering talking about um, responsible repositories. So where do I actually put my data in? Not quickly publishing. Um, we have another one on repository. Um, personal data issues. So all are around um, things that we will see just very um, soon. Um, challenges to sharing data overall. So the state of open data uh, produced a report in 2017 um, in Springer Nature actually conducted um, a survey and published a white paper back in 2018. Uh, we're talking here about 7,700 researchers, quite a big population of researchers. And 63% of researchers did say they share their data. So that is quite a big number. It's considered this keeps growing overall, especially with the open science agenda, etc. However, they have also identified key challenges to sharing data. In this, we're organizing data in a presentable and useful way with 46%. So most of the researchers were worried about this. Unsure about copyright and licensing, 37%. Not knowing which repository to use. So we can actually see your concerns are seen in um, big sample size surveys that are done. Lack of time to deposit the data and also the costs of sharing data. So. When it comes to organizing data in a presentful and um, useful way, we need to think, and again, that's where the DFP comes in very handy because we plan ahead. How will I document my data and how will I be formatting my data? The main aim of the workshop is to enable you to make this sharing of data much easier by implementing a DMT in time in planning for everything. As promised, we have a lot of different links. Um, so please do visit the links. We do have um, a section around managing data at UKDS, but CESTA has also the data management expert guide. If you have not seen it, it's fantastic to be consulted. It goes through different steps in the research data life cycle and how we can make sharing data a bit less cumbersome we also have research data mantra from um, University of uh, Edinburgh um, in the UK. It's a research course around research data management and how to enable data sharing. And there are actually a lot of different useful resources available in the training discovery toolkit done by SHOC. It's for social science and humanities, it's aimed at social science and humanities, and there are a variability of different um, sources you can use to make the documenting your data, the formatting your, your data much easier. Now, unsure about copyright and licenses, and this links to the ethical and legal aspects, and copyright and licenses are no um, easy topics, I would say. Sometimes even from a repository perspective, we do need to have discussions, okay, so can this 
this be shared under this specific license. So it's not a, a clear cut. And that's why we invite all the researchers to start a dialogue with us, provide us the DMP they've done, and then we can have an informed discussion around can the data be shared under which license are there copyright problems. We've covered a little bit copyright yesterday, but as a takeaway, copyright, it's with you when you create something. So always bear in mind when you're using data from others, is it under copyright? One way to make it easier for researchers and for archives is we're providing a variable information log. It's available under CC BY, so please, um, please use it, please share it with your colleagues to actually enable the researcher and us to have a look at the different information available in the collection they want to share the license that information is made available under or whether there's no license and we don't know. It's in the public domain, i.e. it's online. However, is it under a public domain license or is it copyrightable? Do I have terms and conditions? So again, if you are worried about copyright and licensing, do get in touch um, with your repositories to discuss this uh, difficult issues. Now, when it comes to data licensing, I do start by giving the benefits, actually putting a license on data rather than just uploading it somewhere on your website, or it provides clear instruction on how that data can be accessed, used, but also shared. So it's good for you as well. You know, people will share the data in a correct way. It's also good for participants. We know no harm will be done. The consent forms have been respected. And it's also of use to um, researchers actually using the data, knowing exactly what they can or can't do with that data. Now, of course, we have standard open data licensing, and the most used ones are um, Creative Commons. The first release was actually quite some time ago in December 20, um, 2002, um, followed by the open data Commons. So before um, 2007, the creative Commons weren't necessarily very linked to data. So the open data Commons um, have started to actually overcome the shortcomings from the creative common licenses. And of course, we do have government open licenses as well. In the UK, we have the open government license back from September 2010. Um, we are at version three now. And we also have, for example, in France, license overt. Um, I have probably not um, pronounced that correct, um, and I do apologize for that. It just translated as an open license. Now, when we're talking about Creative Commons, actually understanding the difference between the license levels is quite important. We do advise, um, and we have seen in the presentation from Anka yesterday as well, um, as open as possible. So if possible, not to restrict it to only non-commercial use, that is fantastic. Very rarely it does happen in um, consent forms for researchers to use um, that the data will only be shared for research purposes and will not cover commercial use. So that's when we would actually be using a non-commercial license. But usually when it comes to data, most um, open data is either made available under a CC BY, so Creative Common Attributions. Everyone can share it. They can use it commercially. They can adapt, so create different derivatives, work from it, and change the license. Or um, Creative Commons attribution share alike. The share alike means that anyone using the data must share it under the same license. So with Creative Commons attributions, let's say I'm creating some derivative works and I want to publish under the Open Data Commons, I can do that. If um, I am publishing under share alike, I need to use um, the same license. Now, we do have bespoke licenses when it comes to data repositories, and different repositories have, of course, different bespoke licenses to access data. Most of them are around registration. We can see the one from France, Netherlands, Finland, Slovenia. They're all about creating an account with the said repositories, ensuring that you maintain the confidentiality of the data files, that you're going to use the data safely. You're not going to share the data. So this is very important when it comes to derived work. So we're saying we're not going to be sharing the data, so I need to have permission. And the example, this is close to home, of course, we're giving the example at UKTS where we have a three-tier license and access framework. 
Most of the data we make available is under safeguarded access. However, we do provide access to open, open data. When we're talking about open data, there's actually no real disclosure risk. It's most of the time it's aggregate data, data doesn't, that doesn't contain um, sociodemographics. We're talking about data where consent to share personal data is in place. This usually happens, um, again, with public figures is the most common example when we're conducting interviews with public figures. They do want their raw data to become available as it is. We're talking about um, linguistics data as well. That's usually made available under an, an open license as well. Now, as I said, at the UK, yes, most of our data is made available under safeguarded access. And for safeguarded access, there is a potential residual disclosure risk. So what that means um, in, in real terms is there is a risk of um, identifying a participant by putting together all the data in the file plus other information that you might have from the outside. So of course we have seen quite a huge drift into um, linkage of data. So there's a lot of linkage there. We need to bear in mind that we have a lot of um, social media now data from Facebook, from Twitter. Um, if this can be linked to um, survey data you've collected, qual data you've collected can lead to quite easily um, identification. But again, under safeguarded data, we're still talking about anonymized data. So the data has been anonymized, but there is this residual disclosure risk. Because we have this risk in, we actually require all users to register with us. We have an end user license agreement, and then they can use the data. Additionally, for I would say very sensitive data, still anonymized, but sensitive, special category under GDPR, we do offer safeguarded with permission only. So that means, and this actually links to a couple of consent forms that are being used when um, the consent that has been given by the participant is I agree for my data to be shared as long as the research team um, has approved the use. Uh, Permission only means that the data owner or the research team that created that data needs to approve the applications that come for said data. So a researcher is interested in my collection I'm making available under permission only. They need to contact me, let me know why they want to use the data, and then I can decide to share it or not. Um, usually when someone asks to use the data, that is a yes, very, very rarely it happens for a data owner to come back saying, actually, I don't think the data would be of use for your research project, but that happens very rarely. We also have the highest level of um, uh, access, which is con called controlled access. Um, and why I'm saying the highest level, this is data that is considered personal under um, data protection legislation and UK GDPR, the data has only been de-identified. So I've stripped it of all of direct identifiers, name, phone numbers, addresses, etc. But I actually have a lot of information when it comes to sociodemographics. So I have not banded my age. Um, I have not um, rebanded my occupation to something more generalized. It's actually their day to day occupation. So there is a real disclosure risk here. Control data is made available via a safe haven, a secure lab, as we call it at the UK Data Service. And anyone applying for control data, they need to complete a project application which needs to be approved by the data owner. So whoever deposited the data, they have the data in the controlled environment, they actually need to approve the application. But besides that, all researchers that apply for controlled data, they need to have a training. It's now all online, it used to be face-to-face, -face, um, but it's now all online. And they need to actually pass a test based on that training. It's not a very tedious test, but it can be quite, um, easy to fail if not paying attention throughout the course, I would say. Um, they also need to have a specific um, computer that they access it from. So the data is not downloaded on a machine. It cannot be moved. It doesn't leave. It sits in the secure lab environment. They need to get their machine approved to access the secure lab environment and only access the data there. And finally, even when taking outputs out, so let's say I've done my analysis, I want to take 
um, my um, outputs out, my aggregate data out, there are output checks done on the output as well to ensure that there is no secondary risk of disclosure. But again, this is where I'm talking about actually um, personal data. It's only the identified, it's not anonymized. As we were discussing in the breakout room, there are more and more trusted research environments now across Europe as well. Uh, we have actually just gone live yesterday um, to making available um, Center for Longitudinal Studies and Institute for Social and Economic Research data. So here I'm talking about the, the biggest cohort data in the UK. We're now making it available via partner institution from the International Data Access Network. So researchers based in Germany um, will be able to access this data via a safe room in Germany. Again, they need to go through the same process. They need to be trained. They need to have their projects approved. All the outputs are checked, but now they can actually apply to use that data. So there are a lot of um, interesting um, things going on um, at the moment when it comes to accessing this very sensitive um, data. Now, when we're thinking about consideration and licensing our own data, best advice is always consult with the repository. The repository would be able to better say, we think that by applying a uh, our license, the repository license, is better because there's a residual disclosure risk or your data can be fine under a CC by Creative Commons attribution license. But yourself, you need to think about the ownership of the data. So all the repositories you might put data in, not all, most of them, I don't know all of the repositories, but most of the repositories do have terms and conditions. And when uploading the data, you actually agree, I will not uh, breach copyright law, I am not uploading personal data, or I'm not uploading personal data without consent. If you're unsure, again, talk with the repository before. Think about the contents of the data. Has the data been anonymized? Is there a risk of re-identification there? Is it small? Is it big? Or is the data just de-identified? Would you like to have commercial use for your data? And would you like to share it with or without permission. Now, another common challenge of not knowing which repository to use, and we've seen even in the audience here, we do have um, researchers that are concerned in regards to where do I go, usually try to use a domain specific repository that uses standard metadata schemas. Maureen today, and we've mentioned yesterday as well about the persistent identifiers, find the repository that uses persistent identifiers such as um, digital object identifiers to identify your collection and also a metadata schema that's accepted in your community. So if we're talking about social sciences, that's usually the DDI metadata schema that it's used. The Registry of Research Data Repository is a fantastic tool to actually search for responsible repositories where you can deposit your data. In case you are concerned about the options that are given by the Registry of Research Data Repositories, do not forget at universities there is support staff from libraries or from research centers that will be able to use or get in touch with national repositories um, to check. Lack of time to deposit the data. Again, quite a big one. And this is why, and we hope the workshop comes of, um, of help in your own research, because that's the, that's the thing with the data management plan. You're planning in time and the lack of time is actually covered in the data management plan. How do I structure everything within my team? How do I spread responsibilities in order to meet deadlines, in order to make the data available? Thinking about preparing the materials throughout the project is really important. So rather than I'm focused on my analysis, on my own data, I am not going to be bothered with cleaning the data because I know what it is about. Actually, from the very beginning, trying to have a questionnaire um, already set in a format that you can share, trying to, to have variable names and variable labels that are easily understood. It saves so much time to actually do this throughout the project rather than at the very end. Be aware, especially when we're talking about funded research, is there a mandate to share the data? And is there a time period when the data can be shared? 
So um, we are funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK, it was actually the very first council to mandate data sharing in the UK. And the time frame is three months after the grant has ended. So say I have a grant that finished in um, December of 2021. In March 2022, I must have my data deposited. So do have a look at whether there is a mandate to share. If the mandate to share is time restricted, can you respect that time? If the time cannot be respected, again, um, there's a lot of understanding. We're very lucky in the research community. If there is a need for an extension, try to communicate that as soon as possible. You realize that need um, is in place. Now, costing of sharing data. Anka has presented yesterday a little bit about our um, costing tool, but I just said it's worth um, um, highlighting again. We do have the costing tool available on the web. Again, this is under Creative Commons Attribution License. Please share it, use it um, as you might want. Um, when you are doing your data management plan, using the costing tool comes in very handy. And we're going to see there's quite a pattern when it comes to do things throughout the project rather than at the end, because if you do it at the end, there will be a higher cost, especially, for example, if people move from your organization or research, research partners go. It's very important to do it throughout the project rather than at the end of the project. Now, overcoming challenges, um, and I've mentioned a bit earlier on, retrospective consent um, is very important not to um, ignore uh, the benefit of actually being able to do retrospective consent for sharing. Um, and this is very nicely written out in a paper from Kula Aria, Methodological and Ethical Dilemmas of Archiving Qualitative Data. So usually, as we've seen with qual data, there are more struggles there. Um, but sometimes what happens when um, researchers are collecting qualitative data, they do not even give the option of consenting to share that data. It's on the assumption that they share their data with the researcher on a trust level. They don't want that data to go anywhere, even if anonymized, properly anonymized, and no one could identify them. Now, this fantastic research has actually demonstrated in most cases, data sharing is possible. So just by adding, having granular consent form and adding that option would you like for your data to be shared while anonymized with said repositories? Actually, it works. So out of 169 research participants that were conducted by the Finnish Social Science Data Archive, 165, that's 98 percent, have actually agreed to archiving. That is a fantastic um, example of how sometimes we have some assumptions um, that we should be thinking more about, would actually people want that data to be shared? Why not ask them? Now, there's also the option, and this is more linked, I would say, to um, copyright considerations, more applicable to quant data. Of course, you can um, upload um, qual code from Indivo as well. Um, say you use data under copyright, you do not have permission to share that data, you can actually share the code. And it's something that happens very widely now with such a vast amount of data available, as Maureen pointed out in the CESTA catalog, you can find so many studies, you might as well use them. Sharing the code enables others to reproduce your work. So let's say, for example, I'm creating derived variables that others might come in handy. Sharing the code really helps with that. To bear in mind when sharing code, do try to have files that are formatted and the full citation to the data that you've used is included in the code as well. Providing what we see on the left hand side, a metadata record in a repository actually provides a lot of discoverability for the code you've produced for others to use it as well. There's also the option of obtaining permission and attributing original work. Um, and this, this has been a very interesting um, case um, at the UK Data Service. We had to have a couple of discussion with the data, with the data owner. It contains a various uh, data from various um, um, sources. So we have Royal Mail data, 
um, postcode and address elements are actually subject to copyright. The non-address data is under open government license. Um, the Her Majesty Land Registry data is crown copyright and database right. Um, and the energy performance certificates and price pay data have their own copyright notices. So what we have done in this situation was to actually create a bespoke documentation for the collection with license information for data sources. Because they came with these copyright notices, we provided the copyright notices for all users to see exactly how the data can be used and if they want to share the data that the copyright notices need to be made available. As promised, I've included a couple of further readings. One of our ex-colleagues at the UK Data Archive, um, they have done a fantastic research on um, illicit drug economy. So again, we're talking about very, very sensitive data. In her um, project, actually, her um, uh, project will be deposited very soon via UK Data Service. But her uh, publication here actually argues how you can make the data available why consent is so important and how choosing a repository and discussing with the repository in time is very, um, very useful. We also have an interesting um, article, Easy Time to Share Qualitative Research Data, where again, actually being in touch with an archive, with a repository, it's demonstrated how handy it comes. And also a very recent uh, publication from 2021 around data sharing practices and data availability upon request and how much they differ across the scientific disciplines. So now more and more journals are asking for data access availability statements. Um, and some researchers say, I will share my data just get in touch with me. However, that is not currently a best practice because contact information does change. People move from one institution to another. So actually archiving the data in a repository is much more straightforward and provides much more um, um, transparent, transparency. Thank you ever so much for your attention. I will now um, stop the share. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I will stop recording. Um, just for the closing, we're resuming the recording. Thank you ever so much, everyone, once again, for joining us today. Um, we do hope um, the presentations from both yesterday and today came in handy, um, that you will be using the exercise um, in your own training, in your own institutions, and be thinking of the different aspects when it comes to challenges in um, sharing data. So we had a look at DMPs standards, principle, anonymization, quality assurance. Today we had a look at existing resources. Um, how do we use secondary data? What are some considerations when using secondary data? We have looked at a couple of research scenarios, um, trying to identify common challenges in data sharing, but we've also looked in practice how these common challenges appear, uh, what are things that you personally are struggling with, and we've seen it, it's actually quite population representative, what we've got from our short menti survey. Um, do remember, it is Love Data Week. Um, if you um, search for the hashtag Love Data 2022, you'll find many more events throughout the week from um, different institutions around um, the, globe. the globe. It is from 14 to 18th of February, um, so many more events coming up. Um, and I would like to close the workshop once again for by thanking everyone attending today, thanking um, the speakers, um, Anne Kamorin and also our colleague Hina who could not be here today, but she has been um, fantastic in providing enough information for, for us to deliver the ethical and legal um, side of the training. Um, and I would like to close the workshop with a, with a quote from Benjamin Franklin, um, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. Um, and that's why um, we've done the exercise hoping um, that by showing the different scenarios, asking you to think about, okay, so what are the implications here? Actually remembering the information that we've covered um, will be remembered um, and will come of use. Uh, but we'll be in touch with an email as well, um, as soon as possible. The slides will remain on the Google Drive. We're going to be adding the recordings as well. Um, and you can always get in touch with us um, if we can be of any help. We are here to help. Um, so thank you all ever so much for uh, joining us today and yesterday. Um, and we certainly hope to see you soon. <laughs>